will find yourself, Tom. Yeah, uh, I think you sort of got to be. You just yeah. you just learn to love it. Um, so me and my brother, brother in particular, is a big Arsenal fan, oh. and then just from playing there, we now have got a season ticket, and just I go whenever I can, and he goes to every single game. But yeah, watch most Arsenal games and any of the big matches. Yeah. But I'd probably say I'm a bigger England fan than I am a club fan. That's class. Yeah, I'd, I'd much rather go to an England game. And I, my dream of mine has always been to like do all the England away matches. We've done a few. We used to go to World Cups when we, well, we go to the World Cup every year, but I've missed the last couple because of football. But I've been to South Africa World Cup, Brazil, and then the last couple, my sister's taken my ticket. <laughs> and she, does, she, doesn't even, she doesn't even like football. Um, <laughs> but she's World just Cup, ne- next in line. Um, but yeah, all my family last, uh, last year were in Qatar and I was oh. uh, in my flat in Bromley watching on TV oh. um, <laughs> on, on my own, which was which was, which was was rubbish. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd say I'm a big, bigger England fan than I am a club fan. But yeah, I still follow Arsenal. But it's been a bit of a bit stressful now that they're actually good. When, when, <laughs> when, you, when you weren't expecting anything, it's easy because you don't, you don't go to games worried. But now you're going yeah. to games thinking, oh my God, got to win. Um, so it's, it is quite different the last sort of two, three years. But uh, no, yeah, it's good. No, it's class. It's class. I don't think I've ever asked that question and someone said that they're a bigger England fan than a than a club fan. But yeah, well, I know you you played for England as well. But like, yeah, yeah. I've only played twice for England. I don't know about you. Yeah, I know. We did we end up going to the same camp? Uh, I don't think we were ever. Maybe on like the goalkeeper camps and the training camps, yeah, but not in the yeah, matches. Not the matches. I was yeah. with uh, Louis Morden for one and uh, Serene, Serene for the, for the other. One, yeah. Um, but I've always said like England was always the the coolest thing for me. And the be- the best part of my career to date, and probably unless I play for these the England seniors or winner made like a, a trophy of some sort, will probably always be up there as the the best thing. So I think really ever since young that was always the dream, mm. and now that's why I sort of prefer watching England and love watching England all the time. That's class. That's, yeah. that's class. But yeah, like you even touched on it, as football always been that dream, because um, I I always anytime I'm sharing or any anytime I ask anyone about football, I'm always like, how does it start? You know, for me, like my brother's four years older than me, so he was football mad. By the by, the time I was old enough to sort of walk and do stuff, he was straight. You're in goal. I'm shooting. <laughs> um, so pretty much since since I can remember, I was always the goalkeeper. Um, and as we just grew up, I, it became a thing. I used to play for like Sunday league. I'd play outfield and in goal okay. um, for like the A and B team sort of thing. What uh, position out? I was actually a left winger, which I don't think I'd, I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't last a second. Are you left-footed? Yeah, lefty, yeah. Oh, I would nice. have never guessed it. I, I would not last a minute out there now, um, left wing. <laughs> but uh, so And then ever since I sort of went into the academy systems, at, the first club was Cambridge, actually. Um, mm. As a under seven, I think it was under seven I joined there. Uh, but that was straight away. Goalkeeper was always my sort of favourite position. Mm. And then Arsenal came about, we went to Arsenal when I was eight, nine, and was there from all the way through. And, but yeah, it was always a, a dream of mine to be a footballer. Um, but as I'm sure we'll get onto, I've also got the realism of how difficult it is to be a footballer at the top, top level mm-hmm. and how football's not the be all and end all. Yeah, you want to make it work while, while you can. Um, but yeah, it, that life and football is a lot very tricky. And you see that with a lot of my mates who have, a lot of I'm sure your mates who have yeah. dropped out of the system and as you get older you realise how just how difficult it really is but when I was young it was just football's the best thing in the world and that's, that's all sick. you think about Close. it's yeah. every boy's dream yeah like we've had so many conversations about how football has such a big carrot so when we're when we're younger and we're playing for in the academy system we're playing for England we think we've made it I was wondering at that point how did you feel being playing for England, you feel like you made it at that point. I think you feel like you make it e- each year. You have your goals, your targets, and I think as a 16 year old, when you first sort of find out about the England setup, it starts at 15, 16. Mm-hmm. That's your next target, and I think I've been quite lucky. My parents have always kept me quite grounded, but the England thing was wow. That this is it. I'm now. It probably was the first realization of I'm half decent, mm-hmm. and I could do this. Mm-hmm. Um, before, I think it was always a bit of a Every contract was a bit of a well, 50-50, maybe, maybe not. Every time you'd have the discussions with Arsenal when you're 13, 14, you never really quite knew. But at the moment I got called to England and got the, got my debut, I think that was the point where I realised, actually, this is I'm in this for the long run now. Like I've actually mm-hmm. got some, I'm g- clearly good enough. And now it's a case of I've actually got to really hit the ground running now because I don't want it to stop here. I want it to, this to be the first big stepping stone 
to continue on. Um, so I wouldn't say it was a realization of making it, but it was the realization of this is like real now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was that was always pretty cool. I always think. Yeah, and I was re- I was reading something the other day that one of the other goalkeepers at my club mentioned. He said that they'd done a study recently that goalkeepers have like a higher IQ than <laughs> some of the strikers here. And that, <laughs> is this, is this <laughs> that makes me, <laughs> it makes me link. Oh. It shows a little bit into what we're going to get to later on. I know you mentioned this the first time mm. that he's been on a pod where we have three footballers who have yeah. a degree. Yeah. Well, to be fair, this is the first time <laughs> I've been on a pod with two other goalkeepers. One, mm. obviously being a striker, but actually three footballers having a degree. So it's... Uh, it's a really interesting space to be in, you know. Yeah, no, it's like I say, you're seeing it a bit more now with more footballers going into that, starting those sort of things. Um, but it's still very little, there's a very small percentage who are actually doing them. Um, and then back to the goalkeeper IQ, I think we've got <laughs> a higher IQ, but I also think we're a bit more crazy. <laughs> like, to to do some, to, of, to do some to. of the stuff that goalkeepers do and throw their bodies on the ground and they find it fun diving in the mud and when it's raining, I think is a bit bar- a bit Barney. Best, the but best part of the job. That's yeah, it. but I do, the higher IQ I'd probably agree on in most cases, but I've met a few not so clever, yeah. <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> no names, but there, there's yeah. definitely a few. No, no, definitely. No, in every change room that I've been in anyway, the goalkeeper's the odd job. Yeah. So, well done, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so talk me through your experience then, going through the academy system, because what, we're here and we lose these hair about a lot of the outfielders and how they have maybe a smooth trip to the first team. How has it been like being at Arsenal like from a goalkeeper's perspective? Uh, so I was, like I said, I've been there since I was eight, eight years old until I was 21, so just this summer. Um, and I was very lucky that the other goalkeeper in my age group, which you all know, Arthur Oconquo, um, who's now on loan at Wrexham, uh, me and him had quite a good relationship we were good friends um and he was also a, a very good goalkeeper so we sort of always had each other pushing each other so it meant that ne- neither of us were ever sort of sitting still because we always knew the other one was pushing up both of us were constantly being pushed into the year above and going on the tournaments and tours with years above us um seem to remember one to, to holland when he's a 2001 i'm an 02 but we were, went on the 99 tour together mm. and it's just we always had that sort of rivalry but a good rivalry um and i think our our coaches were very good i was very lucky with the my first goalie coach uh lee smelt who would taught the fundamentals very well so i sort of felt like they gave me a really good foundation and then as you get older and you'll understand you sort of know the general technique and the general sort of bits and bobs but it's the little tweaks of positioning or your little tweaks of where your hands are going to set um that make the difference uh but I think my sort of education, football education at Arsenal was was brilliant and I like couldn't fault it. The five, six goalie coaches I've had and plus the outfield coaches um, was very good. But I, I do think a massive part of it is that rivalry I had with Arthur because I think it made it, made my life not easy, but it also mm-hmm. made his life not easy. But at the same time, because we got along, it just meant that we kept progressing through the ranks together. So you guys are pushing each yeah, other. Yeah, um, and I think... It. Without that, I don't. I'm not saying I wouldn't have tried as hard or anything like that, but I think that's really good. And you, you see it in first teams now. That sort of rivalry and the competition for places makes a lot more of a difference than I think people realise. Because if you've just got one person who's playing every game, no matter what, it's very easy to become complacent. Mm. But I think that the competition rivalry makes a huge difference on developing yourself and realising the industry you're in. Because most places, there is no easy ride every place is you're fighting for a new contract fighting for even if it's a one year deal whatever it might be it's not plain sailing ever definitely I feel like what you touched on is so interesting like that football education you have and the details you have to go to in goalkeeping like people some people don't understand that you have to immerse yourself in being able to catch a volley where your positioning and your hands need to be but one thing I wanted to touch on is going through that Arsenal football education, like, what did you see yourself as whilst you're in the academy system? As in what type of goalkeeper? Or or what type of person? What was your aspects of your identity that you had? I was always quite a confident, hardworking team player. And I think that also helped me get through Arsenal a lot more because I think people liked me being about the the place, being about the building, because I'd always, no matter what, give my all, be the the good guy, clean up the dressing room, like just 
being a nice guy. Um, and I think that's one thing, as as I've alluded to to you just before we started this, yeah. the, when especially when Per Mertesacker came in as the academy manager, he made a big point of better people make better players. Mm. And there was a big sort of push on the holistic development, on education, on being doing all these things, life skills. And there was such a key emphasis on it because at the end of the day, it's a team game. If you're, if you're not liked in a team or if you don't get along in a team, people, you, you go by the wayside and people forget about you. So I think that was one thing that I'd always say, I was at Arsenal, I think is the, I was the, the hard work in team player, no matter what. And from that, it always meant that coaches, staff would give you the time and the effort because they knew it would be reciprocated back. And that's one thing I'd always say to any young aspiring players is actually go in with an open mind, be the nice guy who works the hardest mm. because then everyone's always going to try and help you and you're never going to get any enemies or people who go, ah, oh, he's not going to, he's not going to work hard. I'm not going to try and help him. Yeah. So I'd probably say that was my sort of meant, especially from young, my mental sort of side. As you get older, I think you've got to become a bit more, as they say, a bit more of an ugly person yeah, and you've yeah. got to put your elbows out. But certainly young when you're learning your trades and stuff like that, I think it's so important to build build bridges and build foundations that off your personality that you like about yourself because it's going to stick with you for most of your life or career. Yeah, definitely. And people in football, you forget football, people forget good things quite quickly, but they don't forget bad things. So if you come across as a bad person, people go, oh, he's a bad egg and they'll mm. have that down and the amount of contacts there on football, everyone knows everyone. You want to keep that good egg sort of persona about you. That's it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's really interesting because I think you speak about like your early stages at Arsenal, um, but you speak about two people so far in terms of Lee Smelt, who I actually know because he was at Charlton previously yeah. before when I was coming through the academy there, and Pierre Mertesacker. So how kind of important would you say those key early messages around being a good person, um, different values that you picked up from the kind of role models that you had around you? I think it, it, it it's crucial because, as I say, like, without the when you're young without the pathway of how to get there and who to be and all this, it's very easy to get lost in the system because you have lots of people and voices just going football, 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 focused on this, that and the other. And you see it a lot of time with parents, with agents, with certain coaches who are trying to lead you down a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think having a club that had a, a very sort of straightforward philosophy of this is how we want to play, this is how we want our people to be, this is how we want you to uh, learn as a person was very important and I think it makes, especially now, I look at the, the nine, 10, 11 year olds coming through Arsenal, they're gonna have this from the start because I only really started getting mm -hmm. the the stuff from Per when he joined, Only it was only five, six years ago. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, Arsenal was still brilliant when I was there 14 years ago, but the now the detail, the, the depth of how the club wants to be run and with the, all of the staff on the same sort of uh, philosophy pathway, then the young boys coming through now, are just going to be in such a better position than we were because so much goes into them now and I think that's very important for them to make the, make the most of and also understand that how important it is to listen to these guys because especially someone like most of them have been there before mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff I don't know what it was like at Chelsea West Ham mm -hmm. but my growing up most of the coaches I had at one point played for Arsenal mm -hmm. so I remember uh, Greg Lincoln Ryan Gary you had Steve Bold, all these people who had had careers at Arsenal, some of them better, like Steve Bold, better than others, and yeah. some of them who had to retire early because of injuries and all sorts, but a lot of them had been through the system. Mm -hmm. So you look at them and they they know what it's like. Yeah, it's, it's a different time and things change, but they understand how hard it is. And I think that's what one good thing I'd say about Arsenal is the staff around you are very aligned with getting you to the final point, but will help you along the way in any way, shape or form. No, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Just even touching off a small and off the back of that, I know you spoke about kind of people and good people that were a little bit older than you and pouring into you when you were at Arsenal. Did you have anyone else um, in your corner, as I would say, off the pitch or away from um, the club? I think I, I, at Arsenal, a lot of people were just good people. Mm. Um, so I could go could count countless names that were there. All my goalie coaches I've ever had have always been really good to me. Um, I still speak to a lot of them now. 
uh, and same with the, like the outfield coaches, the nutritionists, the psychologists. Most people I'd probably say if I needed them or wanted to give them a call, they would answer. Mm. And I think that says a lot about the people who were, I've worked with. And I think in, in the least arrogant way possible, it also me shows that I think I put a good impression on them that they would yeah. be willing to answer that call or to, to help me out if needs be. Um, and I think that's the best recipe for success. And I think Arsenal have hit on the head. And even like at Colchester now, there's a lot of people there who care a lot. And I think you realise that it makes such a difference in such a pressurised job yeah. that having a good, even if it's just five or six people around you of, of staff makes makes a huge difference. Um, but no, I, I, I've got lots of people who I would go to for advice um, and that makes it a lot easier for me as a, trying to make my career now as a young young pro knowing I've got people past who have done it before or who have been on that journey with me who can always I can always call for a 10 minute chat 20 minute chat mm. just to make sure that either I'm I'm not being silly on what I'm thinking or they can help me out so yeah I've got, I'd say I've got lots but that's because everyone at Arsenal and Colchester so far have been really good to me mm. so I'm quite lucky I think I think it's so important that like, those people in your corner can have a massive effect on the outlook of your career. But well, you, you spoke a lot, a lot about like, your football education and the football side of it. I was wondering how have the people in your corner influenced the stuff that you've done outside of it? So your education that you've yeah. balanced. Well, I, firstly, mum and dad were very keen on education. I think, as I said, when, when we weren't really ever sure if football was really going to be it, Every time we went in for the next sort of contract renewal when I was a young kid, we always thought it's probably not going to happen. If it does, great. But if not, it's fine. So mum and dad were quite always quite strict to me of school, um, making sure I got good grades. Brother and sister both were got good grades, went to good universities, we've got good jobs now. Um, so I was always, there's always, always that rivalry with my brother and sister thinking, oh God, I, I need to match them, I need to, to beat them. <laughs> Uh, and but mum and dad were very sort of keen on the education and uh, when I got my scholarship again uh, they sort of the first thing they said is that's fine but we want him to do his, his A levels um, and the head of education uh, Matt Henley at Arsenal and Per at the time were straight away like yeah no problem do it uh, and then so on and so forth that that went on to university um, which I always remember when I got called in for my to be offered my first pro contract. So I was injured at the time and uh, so it was all quite stressful for me. But the the goalie coach called me and said, look, they're going to bring forward your sort of meeting because you're injured for the rest of the season and we don't want you to stress. So it's okay. Anyway, meeting with uh, Perma Asaka and at the time, uh, the guy who's in charge of contracts, which is uh, a guy called Huss, and uh, talking and they go, right, we're going we're gonna to offer you a deal. So I'm thinking, brilliant. Uh, this is stress over don't have to worry and we started chatting no, no real sort of negotiation as such and I sort of they were just going like we're going to offer you a, a two and a half uh, this this that and the other and I said right brilliant thank you very much but I'm going to I'm going to just say this my mum and dad won't let me sign it unless you pay, unless you pay and help me with my university wow, wow. and they both looked at each other and started wow. laughing and went <laughs> wow. no player has ever said wow that because they they said that, every player comes in and goes oh I'm going to buy a, a Mercedes I'm going to get an <laughs> Audi I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this that and the other and they said no player has ever come and asked them for university yeah. and again without or five minutes You're later a bad egg yeah <laughs> <laughs> You're a bad egg. and f five minutes later <laughs> they were they said yeah no problem we'll support you all the way through university whatever right. you need um we'll do it and so I there's a few people at Arsenal but certainly in terms of my journey outside of football and education, mum and dad were key roles and really pushing it. Um, which at the time when I'm when I'm 15, 16, I'm thinking, oh, I just want to play football. I don't mm -hmm. do it. But actually now looking back on it, I'm very glad that I did it. Um, and f inside Arsenal, like I say, Matt Henley, who was in charge of it, who's the head of education, per head of academy, and at the time, um, Huss, who was the, the, the contracts and the legal guy, all were very supportive and very easy to there was no question there was no negotiation it straight away it was a oh, by all means yeah we're gonna we're gonna help you because we know you're gonna do it i think again because they knew i was gonna do it properly mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was gonna be a a wasted thing i think 
they probably would worry on certain players and certain boys who they're not quite sure on. But I think for me, I think they trusted that I was going to do it properly, which, well, I guess I get my results <laughs> in about two weeks. For, for my, so I'm hoping <laughs> it's going to come all the way through. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say, that, like I say, those sort of three people at Arsenal were very important, but were very good with it. Like, there was never any questions. And then further down the line, when I was doing it, the rest of the staff all knew. So there was a, a support network. People realised... It was always funny when you'd see the, p- p- the staff leaving at five, six o'clock and all the players have already been home for like three hours, four hours mm. and they all look in the classroom and they just see me working away. And <laughs> I remember I remember thinking, like, I can't believe I'm now here f- past the coaches and it's getting dark and I'm leaving. Um, but no, I, th- there was a few there at Arsenal who were very good, but all the staff as a, as a whole were very understanding and supportive of it, which was, which was good. Yeah. And you touched on that key thing that, if anyone hears that they've been offered a two-year contract, they're never, ever saying, oh, yeah. let me go to university. That's the last thing they're thinking about, isn't it? I just knew my mum and dad, I'd go <laughs> home and go, oh, this is, this is the contract. And they'd go, no, 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 no. So, um, but yeah, like I say, no one ever thinks of that. Everyone's ever, ever mm. thinking of their first purchase or getting the car, which nine, nine boys out of 10, when they're 17, 18, get their first deal. A week later, they've got a brand new or blackout Mercedes yeah. or mm. whatever it is, which is always quite funny to watch. It shows a lot of maturity. I was I was wondering how did you find it doing your A levels along like with your teammates? It was it was it was actually I'd say more difficult doing that than the university in terms of this like the the difference with the teammates because all the boys who did the B Tech in sport or sport management whatever, whatever it is, um, but I did maths and economics A levels, so I did two separate A levels, and again as I say. Like, they would finish their days at three o'clock mm. and then I would go into a lesson from 3.30 till 5.30. Um, and that was most days, most nights. Um, I was sort of lucky and also in a weird way that in, the, in my second year, I was injured for most of the year. So from sort of September to the end of the season, I was out of the knee injury, which actually just allowed me to do my work. Yeah, yeah. And in that sense, it made it really good because I didn't really have time to think about, oh, I'm yeah. injured, I'm down in the dumps. I was just, I was busy. But certainly with, when all the boys were finishing at two, three, going home, playing Xbox, PlayStation all night and living the, living the best football of life there is. Um, and I was at, I was hard at work and I'm sure, like I say, you've you experienced a bit doing that bit yeah, extra. Definitely. Like I look back on it now thinking, that's great, but did I miss out on some of my sort of young adulthood? Probably. Mm. Am I, do I regret it? No, not at all, but... I do, I do think that was difficult seeing your mates and even seeing my schoolmates be doing all this sort of stuff, going out or just even just going out each other's houses. But I'd be going, I'd have to do more because I'm doing a full time education alongside being a footballer. Yeah. And it did just take a lot of time and effort, which I say I don't regret. But do I think it maybe missed out on some stuff? Yeah, definitely. Um, but that's part of the sort of what you've got to weigh up if you're ever going to think about it you do have to accept it. it's going to be a lot of time and effort and it's going to be difficult. But if you if it's what you want, by all means, I, there's a lot of upsides to it as well. And I quite, I don't know about you guys, but I actually quite enjoyed, I quite enjoy economics and yeah, maths. Yeah. So doing my A-levels and doing my university, it was actually quite enjoyable because for me, that's what my brother did. It's what my mum's an accountant. So we all sort of have the same sort of educational background. So quite enjoyable for me and it's what I've been brought up knowing as such mm. um so i loved actually doing the actual work which is not common to say but i did enjoy <laughs> it so that's that's what i'm saying so you're like an oddball in the football yeah. world that's so me. When I, whenever i've had I have loads of conversations with toby it's like when you're in that environment where footballers their their first thought is not that education side so it's like how have you found that being in the change room the conversations you've had dealing with the banter in yeah. the change room i think Again, I was always known as a, 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 the smart one in my my team. I was always known as the granddad. Yeah. As I'd, all, I'd, all, I'd like whenever I went on tour, it was always me yeah. looking after the players and you're busy. Yeah, and so I think people sort of always knew that of me. So when I did do it at Arsenal, people never really batted an eyelid because yeah. they just knew that that was who I was. Um, and most of my teammates actually, we I don't know what it's like saying at Chelsea, your Chelsea and West Ham, but our group stuck together quite well. Mm. The the core sort of eight, nine players went all the way through from under nines to scholars. Wow. So 
we had a really good working relationship all of us and we knew each other on a personal level quite well as well when I've gone into like first team dressing rooms people always people are never never surprised that I'm doing education but the good thing at like Colchester now is there's actually what gives it away is your head shape oh, I have no idea it must be something the way I look they, they might, they, I must walk in and people just go right he's a bookworm yeah. he loves it um, but there's actually quite a few at Colchester doing bits and bobs mm. um there's one who does is doing a sports journalism degree currently nice. and he's got a thing in the program every week which is like uh, his page in the program and there's a few others doing uh the, there's a pfa uh director sports directorship sport, yeah, yeah. Sport and directorship. um i know there's one or two doing that so actually in the culture stress room at least it it's not out of place that people are doing extra bits um mm. like that so that's quite good but most dressing rooms there's there's not that so don't know what it is about Colchester and Essex, but maybe there's a there's a there's a few extra brain cells down that way. <laughs> <laughs> don't know um, about literally. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good. It's good. Do you would you say from when you started your kind of education alongside your football that you started to see a kind of tide changing towards education? Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that certainly again we're going back to Arsenal. They Perma Saka really pushes it. Um, mm. No matter what course it could be, it doesn't have to be. Uh, a maths economics or it doesn't have to be academic it can be any other course a holistic sort of thing I'm sure I'm sure if you went to him and said I want to learn the guitar he would be <laughs> all over it um, but there was definitely a, a move towards it and I still every now and then I, I get a call from the head of education saying could you speak to these parents or could yeah. you speak to the, this person or write a bit of a, like a, a sort of not not an essay but a, a bit about myself to give to, to the upcoming uh, scholars and you're starting to see more and more do it. And as I say, coming into Colchester, it was quite refreshing to see actually see three or four boys doing some sort of further uh, education. But like I say, might not be a degree, but just little courses here and there. Um, and it's it's a good thing because I think it's football can get very, as I say, it's so pressurised. It can just get to a point where, yeah, you've got to focus on football. And by all means, football is my number one uh, sort of prospect and what I want to do. But it's very easy to get consumed by football, football, football. And in the modern era of social media and all of this sort of stuff, it's actually quite nice to get away from it and do something completely different where you're just doing something you enjoy. So if you can find that education or that course that you love, and like I say, I love mine, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just quite nice to get away. So, and even if people talk, talk about it with like, even just re reading a book about whatever mm. it might be, a, a book about business or mm. a book about... I don't know, but it's it's good to get away from the sort of stress and pressure of it because, as you both know, it can get it's like a, it's like a pressurized cooker. At some point, <laughs> if you don't know. deal with it or deal with your mental side or do something you enjoy away from it, it can just quite easily just blow. And you see it before players who are just so down in the dumps the whole time because if football's not going well, you've got nothing else to mm. lift you up. Yeah, and like I say, that that's what I also, which I think is good when I've been injured. I've had something to keep me going because mm. it's so easy to get caught up in your own thoughts as a footballer and not just football, any other, lots of careers, but any any athlete or any sport sports person will understand it, it. having something else on the side doesn't have to take up too much time, but takes you away from the stress of it, which is great. No, that's mm. class. That's class. Mm. I think like you said, having other strings to your bow actually helps you with your football. You yeah. I mean, we always use an example of like a Coke bottle when you start to shake it up. If you let the lid off straight away, it's going to go everywhere. Yeah. If you can slouly release it, just like you talk about the pressure cooker in football. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And But it's interesting because you said you enjoy your economics. I enjoy my business um, and my policy stuff that I'm doing in my master's. You enjoyed your, psycho you, you enjoyed your psychology. Um, <laughs> how do you, what kind of advice would you give to a player who's listening who might be like, I don't know what I enjoy because I do workshops with younger players at the moment. Um, and first year scholars yeah. and oftentimes I'm asking them what would you want to do outside of football and oftentimes they're like I don't know all I want to do is football so kind of just throwing that question out there I think again everyone's situation is different but I've found mine through all my family have always been sort of in that maths my brother and sister did the same A levels they did different at the university but we've always been on that so from your friends or your family ask your, your mum or dad or, or your, your uncle or whoever it might be what like about their job what they might do but i think it's just about uh, for me research trying a bit of everything i find found mine quite easily but 
I know a lot of people find it later on or it takes a bit of time. I think being an, having an open mind, um, and I know you can get courses where it might start as a business course, but it has different routes. Mm. And uh, my one, it, my one was a set course, but I know that within the economics sort of courses, there was three or four that if I wanted to, I could have actually changed to, but I didn't realize until the end. Um, or maybe it was a new thing they introduced when I would started to finish that you could do a bit of a different route. But when you say different routes, you so mean like economics specialized into a yeah, different Yeah, area. yeah, yeah. So okay. um, you, you can pick certain modules that will actually take it away from being a pure economics yeah, to being yeah. economics and management or economics and business, economics and maths, so on and so forth. Um, but I think being open-minded because like with most things, you, the first time you try something you're probably not going to like it or it's going to take a bit of time <laughs> bit of time to do it and you've, you always say well you have to try food five times before you actually know whether you like it or not so I think that's the best thing but it's difficult to get that the opportunity to try these things mm -hmm. um, especially in football because you're, you're so busy and when you finish training you're knackered but I think I'd always say use the summer the, the sort of five six weeks mm -hmm. you get in the summer if you know people or if you know your, edu your head of education at, at, your, at your club or ask them about opportunities if you can if, if anyone can set up just like a, a 30 minute zoom call with someone from a business somewhere or I think that's the best thing um I know that it, if I was to redo it I wouldn't change but mm. I'm very lucky but I'd say open mind because you don't realize what you like until you've done it a few times and you're actually in it sometimes um which is easier said than done but I think you just got to try everything as much as possible and you'll find something that you love at some point even if it is as simple as a learning a language, it doesn't have to be a, a full blown three, four year degree masters. It's just finding that thing that you like away from sport or away from whatever your job is um, to keep you sane. Cause otherwise it can get really, like I say, really, really difficult. Yeah, and we've heard a lot of the, the positive sides to studying or studying or doing something alongside your football. Has there been a point where you've felt like, wait a minute, this is, getting a bit too much for me whilst you're studying your a-levels or yeah. your university degree again I, I i'd say i don't i wouldn't say i'd ever got too much but there was certainly times where you're thinking oh my god this is just lots <laughs> um and i've always been quite determined to like my degree was three it could be flexible from three years full time or it could be up to six but i was just like right i just want to get it done yeah. i'm gonna go for three years um and even that, I just think, when I look back on it, would I like to do it? It would have been a lot easier if I'd done it over four or five years and just mm -hmm. spread out a little bit. Because I think at times, especially when I've been playing, it's even difficult. Because you, when you add in traveling to away games and stuff like that, yeah. it just wipes out two, three days a week sometime. Mm. So I'd say my planning and preparation for stuff had to be, had to improve a lot. Um, and I think f for May levels it did. Um, but I always think for me the most stressful time is when I know I've got exams coming up and those sort of three, four weeks leading up to the exam where you go, where you know you've got, a, it's all coming to a crescendo and I'm sitting there going, right, but I've got training, I've got these matches and you've got to really plan and prepare it because I think if you go into it yeah. thinking, oh, I'm just going to do it whenever I yeah, feel, yeah. Yeah. it just all goes to pieces. Um, but I'd certainly say exams, which I think is natural for anyone to get stressed at the exam, exam time um, and I'm sure people who just do it through the school normal school route who are doing GCSEs A levels get like get as stressed as as we probably had, but yeah, I'm, I think I've been quite good with mentally. Again, probably helps that my brother did the same degree as me. My <laughs> my mum knows some like uh, knows math. You definitely got him to <laughs> write so, some of yeah. the essays. <laughs> <laughs> so so I've always been no able. To, no, I've, I've always been able to sort of lean on them for help advice. Yeah. Um, because, like I said, I think if I was alone doing it, it would have been difficult. But I'd also say, I must say, university were very good with me. Um, and they're constantly sending out stuff about well-being, how to deal with pressure, stress, exam, all these sort of things. Um, which I think a lot of universities and places do now. There's such a, and rightly so, there's such a, it's such an important point of mental health, how to deal with all, all these things. Um, that people are getting a lot more understanding of it. And I think... I think that's the other thing. If you're ever going through these things, you've got to put your hand up and say, I need a bit of help here. Yeah. And I think I did that with someone. There was one course um, who 
in a, a econometrics, which is like statistics basically. And it's just, I was sitting there with eight weeks of the exam looking at going, <laughs> what I, 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 is I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and oh, like, I've been there. I, and I remember speaking to my mum about it and my mum was going, you just, just call up uh, uh, Matt, Matt, the education guy mm. and just, just say, look, I need some help. And I'm thinking, thinking no, I can do this, I can do this. And she said, no, no, just do it. Yeah. Mm. And I got an extra tutor um, from Arsenal, a um, guy called Max, uh, and he helped me out massively and ended up doing really well in that in that uh, module. And I was just, but I remember just thinking like, if I didn't sort of admit that I would needed help or, or was struggling, I'd have never have gone out of that. And I know people who, it's very easy when you've got Arsenal behind you who, who, you, who are gonna look after you. But even if it's just calling someone else on your course and mm. asking for these things, I think that's key. But I was quite lucky that I managed to deal with it quite well. But I can say that at times when you needed help, I did ask people around me. I was just lucky that my support, close support network were well suited to what I was doing. Because if I was doing a, a psychology degree, yeah, yeah. like you, <laughs> my, my family or wouldn't have had a single clue how to help me. Um, but I was just very lucky that I had people who had done it before. So whenever I did need a bit of help, I I had it. Um, but I think that's the key the key point to anything. If if you if you're struggling, just got to put your hand up and say, need a bit of help. And whether, in whatever shape or form that is, try and get it because otherwise you're just going to keep on spiraling downhill, mm. and then and then you're stuffed. Um, you're stuffed. And then <laughs> like because you are and that's it. it's you're you're fighting a losing battle. And I think that was the key thing for me was. I like doing things on my own. I'm determined to, to win and succeed. But every now and then you've got to say, oh, geez, I need need a bit of help here. Or I, need, I need some advice or whatever it might be. Yeah. And like I said, I'm sure you guys went through at some point in there where you're thinking, it's just everything's on top of you. You're trying to balance every, your life, your football. And it's just, you need that bit of bit of a helping hand at some point. Yeah, no, 100%. Completely agree. And, and I think you are actually quite surprised when you actually put your hand up and ask for help, how many people are willing to help you out. Yeah. You know, especially people that are more experienced, know their stuff. People are keen on actually supporting each other, you know, and I think it's sometimes a bit of a stigma, you know, to actually say we've got to fight every battle by ourselves rather than mm. say I'm actually struggling here. I, I think actually that's, need to get some help. I think that's a good point. You forget how most people are just quite nice people. Yeah. <laughs> so like they might, they might, they might not, even if they have no way of directly helping the problem, just talking to someone and just getting it off your chest and they might not be able to say anything to really like help th or give you a solution but but not 99 percent of people are just nice people oh. and like it, it's psychological term eh? testing my knowledge it's appealing <laughs> appealing to the nobler motives like ah. people are more inclined yeah. to mm. help and uh, <laughs> but that's me i like you just think even like my teammates now at colchester you think if i've had a problem you go to a, especially like the, the older boys mm. who have been who've been through it and yeah. they're not going to turn you away and say no nah, i'm too busy like the, the people are going to want to help you no matter who they are like because i say most people have got that emotion of they know what it's, they know what it feels like at some point in their life so they don't want anyone else to go through it necessarily yeah. um yeah no it's good it's good i think it's so interesting because I, I always sit down and i think is this the same for every walk of life you know we know football well from a very young age but do you think it's the competitive nature of a footballer that you guys are goalkeepers do you know what i mean in my head I'm not a huge fan of goalkeepers. <laughs> I think I remember playing once. I've come out, jumped to a ball in the in the air. Keepers come out, two hands up, yeah. knee straight yeah. from my back. We'll do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't understand that. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And Protect then, yourself and hurt the rest. <laughs> yeah, hurt the rest. So, so happy day. So, do you think that's maybe the in the psychology of a footballer to say I'm kind of out here by myself on the pitch? Sometimes no one's going to cross the ball for me. No one's going to score goals yeah. for me. No one's going to make saves yourself. for me. You got to do it yourself. Yeah. But I think breaking that stigma and actually saying. No, when we need help, we need help, and creating safe environments to say it's actually okay to ask yeah. for help, not just education, anything, not just football in anything. Cause I do think that's probably yeah, it's very true of football, and imagine a lot of other athletes and and sports people, because you generally you've got to do it on your own. You've got to, you. There's only one person who's going to make it for you, which is yourself, mm -hmm. and you're also so competitive that you sort of feel like you can you can do everything, and you're like Superman. Um, but actually, that is it's a really good point of actually just because you on a football pitch you might feel like you've got to do it yourself at times or you you're as especially as a goalkeeper you feel like you're you're alone at times because it's just you it is important to realize that actually there's a, there's a bigger network out there that actually will 
help you in all, all aspects of, of what you need. Mm. Um, but I think that makes it worse. I don't know about you. Most goals goalkeepers concede, and I don't know about strikers or the stuff you, you miss or don't necessarily do right. We analyse every, every single, single thing. <laughs> even, e- e- even if someone puts it top corner and you've got no chance of saving it, you'll still look at it and go, my footwork. Yeah. How, <laughs> how did I push off? How can you do this? How can you do yeah. that? To top hand, bottom hand, which also I think makes it worse when it when you go to stuff like educational stuff because mm. you you look at everything and go, right? Can I tweak this? Tweak that? When actually sometimes I think you've got to go. Hands up! Well, that that's the best I can do, mm. and even if it's not necessarily the top thing or the top mark, but I think that, I think that makes it worse for me because I'm so used to analyzing every it's single on, yeah. little thing. Yeah even though sometimes you can't do any more than you did. Mm-hmm. Um, probably strikers are probably okay because you score one goal out of five, it don't really matter. <laughs> Literally. But goal, goal give is just constantly, constantly analysing every single little thing. And uh, I think it makes it worse for other stuff because you're constantly in your head going over everything going, mm-hmm. did I do enough? Could I have done this? Could I have done that? When actually sometimes I think you've got to go, gave it your best shot. That's all I could, all I can do. Mm-hmm. Um which is difficult to do, but I think it's the right thing to do at times. I think it's a common it's really theme cool. nowadays in, in the world of sports psychology and goalkeepers and players in, in particular, just the idea of perfectionism. Mm. We're always striving to get to that level, but as you said, that you're not always going to be able to get to that level. No, but so, there's nothing wrong with striving for it. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just, you've got to think... Finding that balance. Yeah. Being, being, being realistic... And it goes back to a very early point of saying when you sort of, when I first realised, oh, I might be a footballer here, but you've got to be, you've got to have that realisation that, yeah, I want to be a footballer, but it's so difficult and you've got to understand that life is going to throw things in your way and there's, there's going to be uh, bumps and roundabouts um, in, all, in all things. And I think that's a really important part for any young footballer or any young person aspiring to do uh, multiple things, go to university, is actually that, got to be realistic with don't set impossible goals mm. I look at that I look at my goal for university and I, I want to get a first mm. but actually if I was to get a 2-1 I'd be over the moon mm. so I'm sitting there going right strive for the top but if you don't quite hit it don't, don't need to beat yourself up about it yeah. like strive for something but it needs to be achievable because I think there's so many people who might say I'm going to do right, I'm going to do football I'm also going to do a degree I'm also going to learn this I'm going to learn that yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's important not to spread yourself too thin mm-hmm because then that's when you start to see negative effects on the things you actually care about the most. And I think mm-hmm. that's also another thing I think I've been quite good with is not spreading myself too thin where I'm l- losing sleep or I'm mm-hmm. knackered for training. Mm-hmm. I always made sure that the, the balance was key. And I think that was the most important part for me because otherwise you just you just start drowning in, in everything. And so that's another bit of I'd say, advice to anyone who's thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Just pick your battles and pick what you want to do pick because... It, yeah. mm-hmm. If you try and do five, six things, you can quite easily get way too much and overwhelming, which is then then you're again you're in you're in trouble. You need to find that balance and that sweet spot where you can do the two or three things that you love the most mm. or you want to do the most and then just go for them rather than trying to do six, seven things. Um but yeah, no, it's perfection's not a nice idea, but <laughs> it's not it's always not possible. Reality, no, yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. No, what you touched on is amazing. I wanted to dive deeper into like a practical week of you. So you spoke about how you might have an away game. Yeah. You're two days loss for you not to, you're not able to now do work. Yeah. Like how would you practically now manage your time so you're able to well, get on and get your work done? It, it always changed club to club, place to place, depending if I was on loan and stuff like this. Um, but I'd always pretty much say Monday and Tuesday evenings, I'd always try to do something um, whether it be just a quick two hours or uh, even longer. Wednesday was always the big working day where I didn't have training normally on Wednesday and you, I'd do as as much as I could on that day. Mm. Same Thursday, same as Monday, Tuesday, do it, make sure I do a little bit. Friday and Saturday was where it got difficult with matches because I didn't want to do too much and overwork myself. Mm. Um, so I'd occasionally do a bit on like a Friday evening and if we were traveling, I, I can't work on a bus or traveling. <laughs> And it's I also like, I also enjoy playing poker too much. To, <laughs> hey. So I, I, I'm also, I don't really want to, I want to, I want to sit and play cards and, or Uno even, um, competitive Uno is always quite a, quite a nutty one. 
Um, uh, can you put class. plus two on a plus four? Nah, you can put plus two and plus two. Okay. Plus four and plus four, knows. but no, no crossing. Okay. I cross. That's good. Nah, I can't cross. I cross. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's mental, that. Uh, it shows nah. a lot about his character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wacky goalkeepers. <laughs> um, but no, so I, I, Friday nights, and maybe do it two hours max, if that. Um, and it would depend on how tired I was, what the game was to my... Saturday's obviously just written off because of the game. Mm. And Sunday again, I'd try to do some on Sunday, but depends if I'm knackered from the game or if we've had a long away trip and we get back late at night. It's just, it's, it's, it's impossible. Um, but again, I was, had to be very flexible with it. The only time it got difficult was that sort of three weeks up to the, leading up to the exam where I would have to sort of be a bit more militant in it and go, right, you've got to do this, this and this and that. But that was for well, two sets of exam periods every year. So six weeks a year where I'd be a bit more strict on yeah. when to do it. But apart from that, I'd be a bit more flexible. If, if I felt a bit tired, I would just leave it. Um, again, trying to find that, strive for that balance where you're doing enough where you, you're you keeping up, but you're not doing too much where it's a negative effect on anything else. Um, but no, it, w it again, it was difficult, but I think I was good being, allowing myself to be flexible. Um, and the other thing about LSE, I was, there wasn't too many deadlines, which was quite surprising. And lectures and stuff, I was given a free pass effectively. To be, they're all recorded and everything was online. But they sort of said, in theory, you meant to go to, I think it was eight out of 10. But they said, like, oh, we understand your position. So I basically had a free pass just to watch them whenever I wanted to, rather than having to be there at that exact moment. Um, so when we had evening games and it clashed or... Sometimes the lectures, because they were because it's an international course all online. Sometimes they were they were at seven thirty in the morning. I'm not waking up for that. <laughs> um, so, but they they were very good and very flexible. That allowed me to actually at times get two or three weeks behind, knowing that I could catch up. And same in the summer months when I had during pre season where there's less games or that I've got my four or five weeks off, I would try and get really far ahead. So that actually, by the time I started up football again, seriously, I was sort of three weeks ahead in the course mm -hmm. that allowed me just to take the foot off the pedal a little bit and go easy. But it, you know, it's all about planning and mm -hmm. being as flexible as possible. But yeah, it's, it does take up a lot of time still. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's so good. It's so good. And you talk a lot about organisation and planning to actually achieve the things that you want to achieve. Is there any advice that you'd give to anybody in terms of, would you say it was just natural for you to kind of organize yourself in that way or would you say there's any key pieces of advice that allowed you to be successful i think i think i was i'm one of those sort of unorganized organized people <laughs> where it's like, like my, 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 my best get the work done yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Literally. My, like i look my mum will be annoyed at me but my my bedroom is a mess but it's all in in the the right piles. Yeah. I know where everything <laughs> is. For you, um, and same, it. same as my uh, my my desk you know, in a little study. Like you look, you walk in there and go, it's a bit of a mess, but I know where stuff is. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's just some people need a a, a structured plan, um, and obviously you have calendars and all this sort of stuff. The only time I ever did that was in those three four weeks leading up to the exam mm -hmm. when I knew right this is where it's going to get stressful. So let's be be set with what you've got to do um but generally my course was cut into two weeks slots really every module was 10 10 sort of mini courses of two weeks give or take mm. so it was quite easy for me to keep on track so i always knew right to get number four done i've got the next two weeks so if i didn't do it for the first week all right, i've got a week now so let's sort of fast track it and do and do it but i think the best thing when it, when things did get stress stressful or pressured it was about having a, a clear structure mm. i know it's different for everyone and it, again I, th I think it's about a bit of trial and error finding what works for you mm. what works for me is not going to work for you too um i don't know if you guys had a, a real structured plan or anything like that but as much as possible i tried to just leave it flexible but in the back of my mind go but this has got to be done by tuesday but it doesn't really matter when it's done as long as it's done by tuesday mm. um but yeah, everyone's different. It's just I'm quite laid back in that sense. Um, I don't know about you guys, if you were a bit more militant with it, but. Yeah, good. for me, I, I just had those set, similar to what you said about those set days and just getting the work done. Yeah. But I really tried to, because I knew football was so hectic, I really tried to get my work done in early so that I know, okay, cool, I don't have to stress and leave it till last minute when there's deadlines. So 
but it's it's really interesting to see. I wanted to touch on like a parent listening to this. They're always like they want their um young son or young daughter just to focus on football and chase that dream. What would you say to them from your experience? Obviously you come from a background where that's that's the norm. But what about a parent that's not that's they don't really come from that background? I think I think first and foremost, it's important to let your kid just enjoy themselves. And I think everyone's different. Some people quite enjoy education and this sort of doing lots of things. But the only reason I it was so easy for me and it was easy for my parents to tell me to do it is because they knew I enjoyed it. Um, and I think I always say that when it, people always ask, would you let your kids do football like, when, when I'm older? And I always go, I always think, no, because I think sometimes, yeah. it, some, some, sometimes <laughs> like, I, I, I know how difficult it is Good and how... Question. But if they loved it and it's all they ever wanted to do, mm. you've got to let them like go for it. And I think it's just important to keep them grounded and not ruin their dreams by telling them, because well, I don't know what the statistic is now, but mm. I was always told it's like 2% of academy players. It's lower at, now. Is it lower? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's important to try and keep them, keep people doing multiple things, even if it isn't, proper schooling as in like proper to have to be mm. learning doing extra maths or extra English even if it is just simple stuff like a few multi-sports or trying to just develop things on the side and keeping a very broadened approach um, but I think I always think I would have hated if my parents put too much pressure on me to not just enjoy football mm -hmm. and they always were saying to me enjoy football but just have this in your background and it was never it was always plan A football this was plan B um and I think you, you only really need to start pushing plan B on them as you get a bit older and you start to mature a bit because while, while kids are young and you're under nines, tens, elevens, you just want to play football. It's like, yes. it's all you want to do. Um, and I think that was a good thing about me was actually while I was young, I w it was just, just go and enjoy football because we didn't think it would last. We thought, <laughs> like I say, we never really thought it was real oh, wow. um, wow. until I got to 15, 16 and you start going, oh, actually, this could be, um, could be it. But I think... Yeah, I, I'm the good thing about I say about my upbringing was my parents just let me get on, and yeah, they kept me grounded in the background. Um, but I think the key thing is for any young, young aspiring academy player, or even if you're a 16, 17 year old academy player, you've got to do it because you love it. Mm -hmm. And I think same with your other stuff, you've got to find stuff that you like to do it. Otherwise, it is just it's just boring. And I think you've got to keep yourself entertained by doing it. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd, my one bit of advice I'd always say to young young kids or parents who have got children coming through the systems, is just like, just enjoy it. Because you actually don't know how long it's going to last for. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm lucky that it's still going for me, but in the same breath, in five years time, it might not be. And you see, I, I've got teammates who I still see who left at 16, who have now got good jobs in the city and are enjoying themselves. Mm. And you think, but if you always ask them, they'd always say, just wish I got another five years or wish I got another couple of years wow. mm. just to really experience it. So I'd always say that just while it's while it, while you've got it, just you, I'd say yeah, never give up on it and like go for it, go for it. Um, but yeah, I would always keep grounded. I think I think it's just that really realistic approach of you know, I want to be a footballer, mm. but mm. I also know that the percentages are against me, and you've got to play you've got to play the percentages at times. Yeah, no, it's so good because um, you're always speaking about kind of transition and you're not never knowing when it's going to be you know yeah. I've played with players that transitioned and left the game at 16 21 27 35 40 you know um, how's your kind of relationship with transition because I guess it's a common reality for all of us yeah we're all still playing we all never know when it's going to end you know you never know when that next contract's either not going to come or you might pick up an injury so kind of how's your relationship with transition and also in terms of doing your degree now I think, you think that's changed a lot firstly I don't like change so yeah. transition's <laughs> always a bit it's always a bit tricky for me um, but I think I think transition it's important just to, to as much as possible I know it's not always possible but to be as fully aware of what the options are mm. and it's not always going to be an option you like but you've got to come to terms with All right, I've got A, B and C here and I think as much as possible, prepare yourself for not the worst because you don't. You never want to think of the worst, like mm. if you get injured. But as I say, 
right now I'm done my university. Um, so I'm still all on football, but also know in the back of my mind, right, I quite like these sort of things. And as I go through the years, if I ever see a, a, sort, of, a sort of a job or hear somewhat, something about something that I quite like the idea of, to do a little bit of research on it, don't do anything, but just sort of try to make yourself aware of different opportunities, different uh, things that are available. Same with when you're younger, as, as we spoke about how to find something you love. I think it's just all the time being open to just doing a bit of research or doing a bit mm -hmm. of learning about something else to prepare you for. Hopefully that day doesn't come till you're 35, 36 yeah. and you've had a full career. But I think it's just about as much as possible preparing yourself. And that the best way to do that is just learning, listening, doing a bit of research on things you find um, whenever that is. That's it. Yeah. So curiosity and yeah. proactivity. 100%. Those are the key um, things that we need to just foster yeah everywhere we go and it doesn't mean you're not paying attention or it doesn't mean you're not focusing on your soul job but it just means you just like I say you just see things and go, oh, it's exactly. quite good i'm going to learn about that i'm going to read up on that um yeah. it's just being as open as possible really yeah and i feel like that all links nicely into a key question on this podcast that we'd like to ask is at this moment in time who are you beyond football uh, it's quite an interesting question, actually. Um, <laughs> to put into words, it's quite difficult. Um, I always like to think that when people look at me or come across me, I'd like people to leave thinking, he's quite a nice guy. Uh, he, he, he's educated in the sense that, not just book smart, but he understands how the world works, emotions work. Uh, and he, I leave people in a position where they think, oh, actually, I quite enjoyed meeting him or quite enjoyed seeing him. Um, and I think I go across that quite a lot. I never try to cause any, I'm never very controversial, I don't think. I'm sure my friends <laughs> and, and, and my girlfriend might say other things that I'm, I I try and stir stir the pot a bit. But I think as a simple thing, I like people just to look at me and go, he's a good guy. And I think it's people, people forget that at the most basic thing, you just want to be nice to each other, mm -hmm. help each other along. Um, but I also want to, on the side of that, I want to be known as hardworking, will never give up. And it's going to try and become the best possible version of myself, whether that be in football, whether that be education. Uh, when I'm fi when I'm 40, 50 and I've got family and I've got a normal job, I just want to be the best possible version of myself, I'd say. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. And that's a quote from Lee Smelt, actually. Is it? Going back right <laughs> yeah, to the beginning. Smelt. He always used to say it to me. Smelt. Forget everyone else, be the best possible version of yourself. Mm. That's close. And that's probably the one thing I held on to the most from him. Which is big up, yeah. big up, smelty. Yeah, like smelty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's been great. It's been great having you on. But I'd like to finish off with some quick fire questions. Yeah, yeah I'll start. Do you yeah. think you're more of a byproduct of nurture or nature? I'd certainly say nurture. I, I, I don't think I was necessarily born hugely athletically gifted or with the skill, but I think I've worked hard. People have helped me along the line, along the way. So I definitely say I was. I'd say more nurtured than I was. Sort of born with skill as some people are Messi or Ronaldo <laughs> Messi I've got to go Ooh. Messi cool. yeah. favourite footballing moment uh, Pers personal and also like what you've witnessed personal would be England England debut nice. um, that was that was good um, then I've witnessed uh, that's a tricky one um mm. I've, I'd probably say either FA Cup final with Arsenal and they, um, seen them win it a couple of times but the one where they came back from Hull against Hull when they were losing or the other cool thing I've seen I'd I'd say Champions League final Bayern Munich Borussia Dortmund oh, when yeah. uh, uh, Arjun Robin w went round I forget the Borussia Dortmund keeper now at the time um, but I think yeah that was also pretty cool just like wow it was quite cool being at a Champions League final sort of thing yeah yeah it's close yeah I have to give a goalkeeper one catch or parry I'd always say catch but parries look well deflected fingertip deflections <laughs> look a better <laughs> save but yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd always say catch as much as possible mm. especially for a young goalkeeper learning always just while you're learning and you're in training always always catch that's it yeah cool so I don't know if you're a reader or podcaster, what would you recommend to someone if it's a book, podcast, series that, that you've listened to? So I listened to a few of the goalkeeper ones, uh, Foscast, um, 
actually just been listening a lot to Peter Crouch. Peter Crouch and Abby Clancy, their yeah. couple quadcasts is actually really funny. I listen to a lot of that. <laughs> um, do Stephen Bartlett's quite a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. I've just got his, I've got his book at Christmas, yeah, so I'll read yeah. that. Um, trying to think, the, the other books I quite like quite like reading, which is probably a bit nerdy, maybe. Um, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, yeah, like yeah, business fi- <laughs> business finance books, really good. Yeah. And then um, so that, that that that's all I do. I, do, I listen to more podcasts now, doing all my travelling to and from Colchester, but I do listen to a lot of the sport ones. I'd say. Cool. Um, but I do enjoy the the Stephen Bartlett ones because um, they also get quite a broad range on there of yeah, different yeah, people, yeah. which I always think is nice to listen to lots of different people rather than just things. Being in p- your echo chamber. Yeah, because obviously the Peter Crouch, the Foscast, it's all just about football and I, it's sort of like I'm still living it. Whereas I think mm. that's really interesting to learn about different people, different people's perspectives. Of course. Yeah. Um, well, it's been brilliant having you on, Tom. Um, I hope listeners can, the listeners are definitely get so many nuggets on the fact that not only can you balance football and other endeavours, but the fact that it's beneficial and that it's, it's necessary. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. thank you for talking on.